It's live now. Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the 58th meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via Starleaf and our witnesses will be briefing us today via Starleaf. Just to highlight, the meeting will be broadcast live when open to the public and a recording will be made available on the committee's webpage on the agenda website. And just to remind members to mute their devices when they're not speaking, please. Um, so moving on then to item number one, which is apologies, and we have apologies from Mervyn, and I think nearly everybody else is here. Everybody else is there, nearly sure, yeah. Um, okay, so moving on then to item number two, um, which is draft minutes. There is a copy of the draft minutes um, at the meeting of the 14th of April at page five of your pack, so our members content that those are an accurate reflection of the meeting. Great. And then there is a copy of the draft record of decisions of the meeting on the 14th at page 15 of your pack, so our members content that those are an accurate Great. reflection. Thank you. Okay. Moving on then to item number three, which is chair's business. There is a memo um, in the table papers of the, um, the meeting that we did informally last Thursday morning with Hospitality Ulster. So members will have the opportunity to explore the issues that were highlighted with the Minister when she briefed the committee on the 12th of May, and in particular the roles of various groups such as the Economic Advisory Group, the Tourism Recovery Working Group and the High Street Task Force, which have all been established to focus on economic recovery. The Clerk has also been liaising with the, um, the Clerk of the Executive Office Committee about a concurrent meeting of the two committees to hear from the interim head of the civil service about the High Street Task Force and a date of the 16th of June at 2pm has been agreed and is in um, Jenny Piper's diary. So that's just to, to note at this stage, unless you have anything additional to add, Peter. No, Chair, just that we've, we've established that because the uh, Executive Office Committee is delayed, we'll be in their time slot rather than ours, so that's why it's 2 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, but hopefully the, the 16th of June will give members a chance to, to arrange diaries to suit that. Okay. Um, can I just ask members to, to make sure that they're on mute because there's a wee bit of feedback coming through. So if we move on then to item number four, which is our first briefing this morning from the Financial Services Union on the, the bank branch closures. Um, this obviously is one of our short meetings today, so just to remind members if they could be concise when they're asking questions, then, and 45 minutes has been allocated to each of the briefings, um, and we do have some other business to get through. So there is a clerk's memo at page 23 of your packs on this briefing. There is a briefing paper from FSU at page 26, um, and a paper from Ulster University Economic Policy Centre on COVID-19 and the Fourth Industrial Revolution at page 40 of your packs. Peter, you sent something additional this morning. Yeah, this morning I've sent Chair a set of slides that the FSU will use, but they'll share their screen, but it's just so that members have their own copy. Okay, thank you. So can I welcome to this morning's meeting Sharon McCauley, who is President of the FSU, John O'Connell, who is the General Secretary, and Brian McDowell, who is Head of Communication and Public Affairs. So if I hand over to yourselves to make an opening statement, and then we will bring members in for, for some questions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. And we very much welcome the opportunity to address the committee here this morning. What I'll try and do is try and share the screen, and if it doesn't work, we'll we'll abandon that, and I'll, I'll talk directly to the committee. But hopefully, we'll be able to show just uh, a couple of slides in in relation to uh, our discussions this morning. So hopefully, Chair, everyone can see those those slides. Um, Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, perfect. So I could just, uh, uh, we've only eight slides, uh, Chair, and thank you and the Vice Chair and the members of the committee for giving us this opportunity to address you on what we believe is a really important topic, particularly for the Economic uh, Committee. So um, in, in terms of the FSU, we represent uh, financial workers and fintech workers north and south. We now have um, members in over 90 companies uh, north and south, uh, and we also have members, legacy members in the UK from uh, 
both Bank of Ireland and Aladarsh Bank having branch networks uh, in the in the UK. So, um, so we have quite an extensive membership. It's quite a changing and dynamic sector. Uh, and I suppose part of what we want to talk about today is uh, how change comes about, how communities and society uh, is involved or not involved in that change and the impact of those changes. And at the end, I'll, I'll explain why we're calling for a forum on these issues, uh, again, both North and South, and why we think it would really uh, uh, be a good thing for us to establish a pathway forward for the type of banking model that, that we want. So just to commence, Bank of Ireland has is, is, uh, just announced that it's planned to close 15 branches in Northern Ireland. We all know that Ulster Bank has indicated that it is going to uh, withdraw um, from the Republic of Ireland. And the impact on that in Northern Ireland is that there are 600 jobs that directly service Ulster Bank in the Republic of Ireland that are based in Belfast. And so we believe those jobs are salvageable uh, and can be saved with the right efforts. And we have time on our side because the wind down will take a considerable amount of time. But we really believe those jobs are, are in a group as big as NatWest, uh, potentially uh, savable. Um, and we have uh, done a lot of work in terms of engaging with NatWest in that regard. All it requires is a decision in NatWest to transfer work, uh, to replace the work that will evaporate as the Republic of Ireland is wound down. Danska itself closed four branches last year. And in 2017, AIB announced closure of 15 branches. We've seen the, the growth of Revolut and Monzo uh, as you know, just one aspect of uh, the finance and fintech sector and the explosion in, in membership or in um, customers in, in those type of uh, digital um, banks, if, if that's what you call our finance houses and, and so forth. But uh, Revolut is regulated in Lithuania uh, and there's a lack of ad ad reg regulation and regulation hasn't kept up pace with the developments and certainly the developments in uh, technology, algorithms and so forth as people um, use technology more and more. So uh, what we would argue is that there's no strategic plan for the future of banking. It's just at the moment be left to banks uh, and that that is leading to a situation where uh, critical services are being denied to, to vulnerable uh, people, particularly at this time, more so than any other time. But in the normal course of events, if we were outside of COVID, the impact on uh, householders and on um, communities and society is significant. So, as I said, Bank of Ireland planned to close 15 branches in Northern Ireland starting in June. The UK regulator has asked banks not to close branches during COVID. Uh, so, uh, we can't understand why uh, they're not being paused at this present time, given that that's what the regulator has, has said in guidance that they have issued. We know from a House of Commons study uh, that um, focused on the issue of SME lending when a local branch closes, that it drops by 64%. So put ourselves another few months down the road when the economy will be starting to open up fully uh, post-vaccination and we have a situation where a significant footprint of the banks has been withdrawn just at a time when the SME sector in particular needs it and needs the support of banks and of the local branch. Uh, so in, in terms of what happens then, we believe is that local knowledge is lost. Lenders are skilled people, the regulated professionals, and they're skilled people. Uh, and the people who are hit most are the most vulnerable uh, in situations like that. They don't have the mobility that everybody has. They don't have the digital literacy that everybody has, and they're the ones that, that are impacted uh, the most. So in terms of the issues, we see the lack of adequate regulation. The impact assessments that are carried out are done after the decision is announced. There's no consultation with local communities prior to any announcement. Uh, in Bank of Ireland's case, they refuse to share the terms of reference for the strategic review, uh, and they are able to ignore the voice of the UK regulator, which is extraordinary when you think about it, and the powers that regulators have that the bank can go ahead and proceed to close branches when the regulator has uh, specifically asked for a pause. The bank's use of COVID to deny critical services to, to vulnerable people, so 
Bank of Ireland acknowledged that branch closures affect vulnerable people because in Northern Ireland they're required to do an impact assessment even though it's after the announcement. And in that impact assessment, they explicitly say that they recognise that vulnerable people are going to be uh, hit the most, but they still insist on, on closing. Uh, they haven't published uh, the footfall numbers for each branch, uh, and we're calling for that and uh, for transparency to come into this process, because it's our belief that notwithstanding the fact that people are adhering to government guidelines uh, in relation to um, not making unnecessary journeys and only going on essential travel and, and, and so forth. The, we still believe that even in the pandemic, that people still have essential banking matters that they need to attend to and that the footfall numbers will verify that. Uh, and so we're calling for that um, to be published so that there's transparency around this. And equally, there's no plan for people who aren't IT literate. It's just that the branch will be gone uh, starting in June. Uh, and people are being left to fend for themselves. So the reason why we believe there's a need for a structured debate is because all stakeholders are working in silos. So th there's a lack of an overall strategic approach that communities, staff and customers' voices are being left behind or not even being heard in some instances. And that once the branch network is gone, it can never be rebuilt. Uh, and you know, there's whole sectors of society that would rely on branch networks, farming, the SME sector, and was, as we said, the more vulnerable in community, uh, in our communities, that rely on a face-to-face -face, uh, intervention in, in terms of their, their banking. And equally for us, that, that maybe are more digitally literate and so forth, we still need the branch network. If the digital platforms are down, so in, in the past um, month here in Dublin, uh, a couple of things have happened. The phone network went down. It's uh, number one on the, on the headline news when it happens, even though it was only for a few minutes. And equally, the Microsoft system went down. Again, that was a global outage. Uh, and again, that was headline news, uh, even though the outage was only for a few minutes. And I, we believe that, that uh, with cyber security and cyber crime and, and so forth, people need the stability of knowing that if everything else fails, that they can walk into their local branch uh, and access their funds. Uh, and that um, that is just one reason, but a good reason why branch networks should be retained. So we call for a, the need for a structured debate. The key issues, lack of public trust in, in banks, uh, they, you know, when they make decisions like closing branches without consultation and so forth, that feeds to the, the issue of public trust in, in banking institutions. The speed and the nature of change. We don't believe that change needs to be as brutal as it is, both for communities and for staff and for customers. International and, and EU trends in banking, how they uh, are impacting in, in terms of banking, and particular, as I said, artificial intelligence, digitization, what that impacts uh, in relation to, to banking. We don't want a situation where you know, decisions are made about loans or about my finances or your finances with no human intervention that it's based on an algorithm uh, that isn't transparent and that I don't know why I'm being turned down. I'm just being turned down by a machine. So we don't want to get to a situation uh, that that's all that's left of a, of a banking infrastructure. The branch network, as I've touched on, the SME lending, the digital risks and financial exclusion uh, and uh, literacy and digital exclusion. And equally, the culture of banking, banking ethics, and, and, and whistleblowing. We, we think, in, particularly in around whistleblowing, and that, that uh, recent developments in, you know, in all jurisdictions across the world has shown that, certainly in the finance sector, that the issue of whistleblowing and whistleblowing protection needs to be revisited because it hasn't served the, the purpose that it was uh, originally envisaged. In most of the scandals that have occurred across the globe, uh, there hasn't been instances where people felt that they could speak up. Most of them came to, to light by other matters or other means rather than, than by somebody speaking up. So the objective would to have, be to have a structured and inclusive engagement on the key issues affecting all stakeholders in the sector and plan as far as possible a strategic approach to the future bank. Engaged um, uh, with the, the Minister for Finance in Northern Ireland, Conor Murphy. We've met with him. Uh, uh, he is um, 
enthusiastic. I don't want to speak for him, but he was enthusiastic in his conversation with us in relation to having a debate before all these decisions are implemented in time to have a, a, an impact in, in, in relation to it. So, Chair, that's that's my presentation in, in terms of uh, today. Our ask is to, for the establishment of the banking forum that includes all relevant stakeholders and that branch closures are paused until the pandemic is over and until we have a proper debate on what we want uh, as a society in terms of the future of banking. And that includes all stakeholders, staff, customers, communities, uh, and give us the opportunity to uh, have a proper debate about how change comes about going forward. Thanks very much, John, for that um, really useful overview. And certainly, um, well, I've engaged with yourself previously around, around the branch closures, but um, since Bank of Ireland had announced very recently that they would be closing the nine branches at the end of June, beginning of July. Um, I, I've been in correspondence with the, the Financial Conduct Authority just in relation to you know what, what do they consider during the pandemic because that's what their guidance is is you know calling for that branches shouldn't be closed during the pandemic um, and what what leverage do they actually have on banks in terms of you know actually implementing that guidance is that something that um, that they can enforce in any way and I was wondering do you have any, any insight in relation to that? No, the, the, the Financial Conduct Authority engaged with us and we made a submission in um, late last year because they were reviewing uh, how branch closures come about, what the um, engagement is with the various stakeholders and, and, and so forth. Uh, and so we engaged with them at that time uh, in relation to what our views were. And our views, like, we're a progressive trade union. We take the view that things change, but we also take the view that you have to bring staff and communities with you through this change. And, and so when we spoke to the authority, we highlighted things, uh, and this was, you know, in, in, in terms of not just pandemic, but in the normal course of events of how uh, banks arrive at decisions, that there must be much, much more transparency around the reasoning for it, the, you know, so we're being told at the moment that it's footfall, but everybody knows, as I said in the in the presentation, that footfall is impacted because people are adhering to the guidelines that have been asked to adhere. So to use footfall is is really cynical uh, exercise in in this point in time. So we that's why we believe a pause and a debate would be a good thing we're not saying that branches should never change or close or 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 that but we're saying how they change and how they close must take a, a much broader view because if the sector and the network is dismantled it will never be replaced yeah and i think it's a very reasonable call for a forum to discuss these issues and certainly that's something as a committee that we will take on board in terms of our engagement with the banks also um, and in terms of reflecting that back to the department and to the minister. Um, just if I could ask you a couple of questions John in relation to the specific impact on staff and, and also customers um, in relation to the closure of branches and the moving of accounts to uh, neighbouring branches and also of the staff that will be redeployed if that's what they wish um, and what is your understanding of the the numbers involved in terms of, of bank of ireland's staff um, that would need to be made redundant and that potentially um, would be redeployed is that something you think is manageable um, within in the context of the, the closures that we're seeing over the next number of months I, I think that's the dialogue that we're engaged with at the moment with, with Bank of Ireland. With Danske Bank, uh, they gave a commitment that there would be no redundancies, which it's welcome in itself, but we would rather that, that uh, the network would be retained. But they gave that commitment that there would be no redundancies. In Bank of Ireland's instance, they offered voluntary redundancies or have offered voluntary redundancies to people, plus redeployment. So we're working through the, the mechanics of that in, in terms of um, how that will impact on people. But a lot of people, you know, in, in, in terms of the branches and the options that are being given, it comes down to the individual and how that impacts on their, on their life. So people have caring responsibilities. They may live in 
work in the same town and, and so forth. So there's quite an amount of detail to be worked through in, in relation to that. And that's why, again, time can be our friend. If we were in a position to have a pause, we can you know, have a much more detailed work through in terms of the impact on staff and indeed the impact on customers and transfer of, of bank accounts and so forth. Yeah, I, I think some of the feedback that we have had in relation to customer accounts is that they might not be the, the closest branch that they are being moved to um, and it would be useful to have an understanding from Bank of Ireland's perspective as to you know how that process and decision is made as well. So as you say, um, greater transparency around all of these decisions would be would be most welcome and and have the uh, ability to do that through a forum like what you are proposing would be very useful um, and I think for us as a committee as well one of the um, particular aspects to these closures would be the impact on particularly smaller businesses and you have indicated in terms of your presentation the the impact on on loans where you know businesses would have relationships with in branches that have been built up over years and um, and that the, the impact that that then has when the branch closes, but also you know just the kind of provision that will be made for businesses, particularly in rural areas, um, even you know the, the things like night safes. I think there's one that has been highlighted to us as well, where um, the ability to lodge money and there would be security concerns for businesses, those types of things. Um, and it, I, I just feel that there is a need for a lot more. Um, discussion and clarity to be given around all of those things? Yeah, no, I'd agree. And, and just think about it, asking staff to make life-changing decisions in terms of where they're located and where they're working or whether they leave their employment or not during the pandemic. It's, it's just wrong. There's no other word for it. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I'm going to bring in some other members here for questions. Um, Stuart's up first, so can we bring Stuart into the spotlight, please? Uh, thank you very much, Chair, uh, and thank you, John, and your colleagues for, for, for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, and as the Chair said, there's, I think there's a lot of concern across all of our constituencies about the loss of uh, so-called high street banking. Um, uh, I've seen it here in East Antrim, loss of Bank of Ireland branches over a very long period of time. Um, and um, it, it's proving very difficult for customers. There's a lack of competition on the high street, and I guess that's where people, first of all, look to decide where they're going to bank. Um, um, uh, that's a difficulty as well. Um, many people are being pushed by governments. I, I take it's the same situation in the Republic as it is here, uh, to particularly those, as you've described them, as uh, vulnerable or, or don't have access to, to a great deal of technology, are being pushed to use post offices. Post offices are no substitute for banking, but I'd like to understand what, what your relationship is with the post office uh, as a business uh, and what your view is about the type of banking which they deliver as an alternative uh, to, to standard banks. The other area I would like to explore with you is the whole impact. You've talked about the impact of COVID. Hopefully, we're moving out of that. I want to understand, I want, want to get your understanding of the impact of Brexit on banking uh, north and south. Uh, we have concerns. We had a debate in the Assembly this week on uh, the two big credit card companies, credit and debit card companies, uh, hiking prices. Um, some, uh, indeed, a great deal of financial regulation is out of the hands of the Northern Ireland Assembly. The vast majority of it is UK, gov UK government governed, uh, and we have very little say in these matters, except to perhaps jump up and down and complain about them. But uh, I think, in essence, what I'd like you to do is just tell us a little more about how you see the future of your relationship with post offices, many of whom used to be high street services themselves, but are now pushed to the back counter of supermarkets. They're not easy to find quite often. Uh, and then and secondly, if you could uh, just talk us through some of the difficulties that you envisage or indeed that you've had to work with in terms of Brexit. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Thank you, uh, Stuart. And just to, in, in terms of the post office piece first. So, you know, there are some issues, or there are some uh, transactions that transfer well into uh, a post office. But there, my experience, in, in terms of, and I've used uh, the, the same model 
in, in terms of down here that there's banks that have turned some services into um, to the, but my experience is that it more complements the existing bank network than replaces it. And what I mean by that is that there's more that you can't do in the post office than you can actually do, right? So when you go and you present a check and they say, oh, sorry, we can't take that, you have to do this, that, and the other in, in, in relation to it. So for a straightforward transaction to deposit cash into an account, it, it, it seems to work okay, but any start and isn't that why we go to branches? Because the transactional stuff we can do online and, and, and so forth for the most part. So that, that has been our experience. So it complements rather than replaces. Uh, and equally, most of the things we talk about design are of a confidential nature because they're substantial financial transactions. They're my mark or my loan for my car or the digital that I'm having. I don't want to have that conversation, and most of those conversations I couldn't actually have, but I don't want to have any of those conversations in a post office. Sure. You know, I think that's the first thing. In terms of Brexit, I think the, the, you know, we have a situation or had a situation where Ulster Bank was on, undergoing a strategic review, Bank of Ireland was undergoing a strategic review, AIB is, uh, has a three year plan, and, and so forth. So I think Brexit has been a driver in. in, in terms of change and not necessarily in a good way. Uh, so in in the discussions or the debates or, or the, the communications that those banks put out, they, they cite regulatory costs and the cost of doing regulation, uh, um, the cost of doing business in the different jurisdictions, north and south. It's the same story was put out by Ulster Bank as was put out in uh, Northern Ireland by Bank of Ireland, that it was the cost of regulation and, and so forth. But I think that was a bit of a Trojan horse in, in, in the sense of we, we think they we, we you know using the issue of regulation to uh, drive changes that they wanted to, to drive through. And I think um, uh, Brexit was probably an accelerator in that regard. Uh, but I don't think it was a, a full open debate in, in terms of regulatory because Bank of Ireland has remained in the Northern Ireland market. The regulatory costs are still the same as they were before they did their uh, proposed retrenchment. So I, I think in, in some ways it, it wasn't an open and transparent debate like we we're calling for where facts are put out on the table and we can, can work through them and see are there regulatory challenges about doing business that, that could be represented and could be altered or amended to support uh, better business or is it that it's just about uh, profitability uh, and enhancing, continuously enhancing profitability at the cost of communities and staff. Thank you, Stuart. Can we bring John O'Dowd into the spotlight, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the points I was looking to cover are, are largely have are, are largely been answered. Um, there, there's two branches of my own constituency being closed, one in Portage Island and one in Bombridge. And when we met with the Bank of Ireland, they have confirmed those closures are moving ahead, though they said there's no redundancies. And in terms of uh, the Financial Conduct Authority and their recommendations around no closures, is there any uh, way that that can be enforced, or is that just simply a recommendation? I know that the chair covered that earlier, but is, there, is, it, is it enforceable? I, I think probably the, the conduct authority would be best place to, to talk in terms of the enforceability of it. It's certainly morally enforceable, we would argue, that if the regulator is saying, look, the most impacted people during the, the pandemic uh, are those you know, uh, who access banking services and so forth, and they need to be protected during this time. So certainly morally enforceable, and we think it's actually shameful that the banks haven't uh, adhered to the to the uh, FCA's uh, call, and and maybe it's a it's a matter for the FCA to strengthen that call uh, and to intervene at this stage in, in in terms of the proposed closures. Thanks, um, John. Is John? Are you finished? Yeah. Uh, in terms of the, of the ongoing reviews across all the banks. Are they engaging with your failure in a constructive model of defense? Is, is there a planning going on between your sales and the banks about what the future of banking will look like moving forward? So, 
We're, we're having this debate uh, with the banks, and, and each of the banks have indicated that they would welcome a debate, that there's things that they want to debate and put out, and that we should be open enough and mature enough to hear as well in relation to the challenges of uh, banking in Northern Ireland. And, and so uh, each of the, the CEOs, we met with each of the CEOs, and they have indicated that they would welcome a debate, a broad debate, as long as it's focused, we don't have any issue with that. Uh, the regulator in the South has, has also called the credit unions and, and post office to be part of that discussion. Again, we don't have any difficulty with that. Um, but essentially, it's to, to get the debate underway uh, and for people to commit to that debate and, and for it to be a, a proper, um, mature debate that plots out a future that doesn't leave us you know, wondering in five years' time uh, how did we allow uh, Branch networks be you know dismantled uh, and end up in the situation that that we're in. Again, it's not a no change agenda. It's change at a pace that people can accept. And doing stuff under the cover of the pandemic is you know the, the kind of culture that the banks were called out on previously. Uh, yet they seem to be replicating that that behaviour of taking any opportunity uh, to retrench services from communities and, and from customers. Thank you. Can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Thank you very much, Chair, uh, and thank you, Juan and team, for the presentation this morning. This is a really important issue um, uh, that, that should be of concern to, to everyone. Um, <laughs> the bank communities is, is definitely coming to a close uh, unless we have a joined up approach or a joined up strategy in order to protect and ensure that the bricks and mortar provision of banking um, is maintained in our high street. And one of the areas, John, that I, I, I want to talk, and you just mentioned it there when you were talking about the strategic review of the future of banking, uh, and you spoke about the regulator indicating that uh, credit unions would take part in that conversation. Um, a lot of the bank closures are actually happening in rural areas. Uh, and that is really unfortunate because you know um, if you if you live in a rural area, sometimes the only access um, that you have maybe to banking is is your local uh, village uh, high street, and um, I, I know one withdrawn. Uh, for example, my colleague uh, Pete Byrne um, uh, in Cross McGlen, he said Bank of Ireland is actually the hub of um, the village centre. So you know when this is removed. It is really, really uh, difficult for people, and those not everybody um, is digitally connected or digitally capable, um, and they need to have um, that that resource, particularly SMEs as well. Uh, and there's a safe element um, uh, that is attached to it. But you talked about um, credit unions. Is there potential for credit unions to move into that space that has been vacated? Uh, by the banks and provide daily uh, banking services, uh, lodgements, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, they, they have the IT equipment, maybe it's not totally aligned um, uh, to, to the banking IT uh, infrastructure, but it certainly um, seems or appears to me that it would be a possibility um, that the provision of services could be provided for our credit unions. And credit unions are in all areas of our high streets and all parts of, of um, Northern Ireland. Is that something that you considered? I, I, I think, again, it's, it's similar to the answer I gave on the post office, is that these, you know, these institutions, the post office, hundreds of years, credit unions over a significant period of time, and banks equally hundreds of years. So they have evolved. Um, and so I think each has its place in the, in the market. So I think credit unions have their place. I think, again, they're more complementary than uh, competitors in terms of, of, of the banks. I think uh, they have a role to play in, a, in our society and fulfill a great role in, in, in society. But I don't think it can be a replacement uh, for, for banks, particularly if you look at it from the, the SMEs uh, and the, the industrial sectors and, and trying to develop um, uh, jobs in our communities and so forth. 
one of the big challenges, as you said, is that in a lot of these instances, in the cosmic ends of this world, that, you know, the alternative is, well, you can do it digitally. Well, you can't actually. The broadband service from Tokor isn't as mature or isn't as good uh, in rural areas. And, and so, um, and, and, and that, none of that is taken into account because there isn't a debate beforehand where these things are factored in, our footfall is factored in. So if it is the hub, and I have no doubt that it is the hub of, of uh, a tribal community in, in Cosmo Glen, that's not been factored into account because we can't see the figures. If we could see the figures, we'd be able to validate that and say that it is a vibrant branch. We do know from, from uh, information we got from, from colleagues that in one branch, uh, that there's 220 people and now we're leaving the branch and this is a branch that's labelled for closure uh, in Dublin and, and that doesn't tally with the reduced footfall message from, from the banks so we, that's why there has to be transparency around these things if it's a case that the services haven't been used and, and that, that's one thing but if it's a case that that's what's been said but in actual terms that's not what's happening or if it's because it's a temporary measure um, because of the, the pandemic, well, that's a different matter. And, and that's why a debate is necessary rather than just announce a closure yeah. and the clock is ticking then before the community is, is robbed of its services. Thank, thank you, John, for that. Uh, and really, just to say, uh, we all know that you know the future of banking is going to change. But it's the nature um, of how the consultation on these branch closures that is very disappointing. Uh, I mean, it was an open and shut case whenever the announcements were made about uh, Bank of Ireland, uh, and, and that's regrettable. Um, so thank you very much. I think it's an important conversation, and that we'll probably have to revisit it again in, in uh, the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Can we bring Gary into the spotlight, please? Thanks, Chair, and thanks for um, the presentation, uh, John. Um, look, I, I share a lot of the, the points that you've made. Um, I, I think that uh, the role of our uh, banks and our high streets and our rural areas, uh, they are so important. Uh, you know, I, I have seen firsthand this week um, the importance of the local physical branch uh, to, to my mother-in-law who, who uh, lost her husband. Uh, she, she doesn't have the, the uh, access to the internet that, that you know, her partner would have had. Um, she, she relied heavily on being able to go and to speak to someone uh, physically and that is so, so important. And there are people day and daily who require that type of physical uh, support. And you know, people who, who work on these branches, whilst they're dealing with financial matters, they also provide a, a compassion to people uh, when they're dealing with uh, issues which are serious uh, and affect their lives. So, so I want to say thank you to those people who are doing that. Uh, what we need to do now as elected representatives and, and, and as people who uh, can try and uh, make a difference, we need to, to, to save those branches uh, and we need to uh, ensure that we stop the tide uh, that has unfortunately been continuing over this past, uh, well, many years uh, against physical uh, branches. What I wanted to ask, uh, John, and obviously you've highlighted a number of uh, issues or solutions that maybe we could try and, and work towards. In terms of our role, I suppose, as an economy committee, and, and you know, obviously we hold the, the economy department to account and, and, and work with them to try and uh, address issues such as this. In terms of immediate actions, you know, what, what would you see, John, would be the quickest and most effective um, action that we could maybe try I know it's maybe putting you in the spot but something we could look here's what needs to be done immediately uh, that, that you know and would make a real difference to try and stop what's happening uh, to these branches okay thank you for that Gary yeah I, I think there's probably a couple of things I think you know uh, as uh, um, as a committee of the assembly I think you have a, a level of authority and level of gravitas so I think engaging uh, further with financial conduct authority. I think the worst thing we can do as a society is just to accept things. So I think at, at the very uh, least, we should be reaching out to the, to the regulator and uh, engaging with the regulator. Uh, and, you know, the, the regulator has, has made the statements 
uh, that they have made. So we'd be looking for the regulator maybe to back that up. Maybe with a pandemic regulation that says uh, thus far and no further until such time as we're out the other side of the pandemic and out see the other side of the pandemic economically as well, because the economic shadow of the pandemic is going to cast a much further shadow than the actual year or year and a half of the pandemic. And so uh, I, I think the regulator has a huge part to play. I think it would be really helpful uh, to um, engage with the banks to the committee in, in terms of um, them coming and explaining themselves to the committee in, in terms of what they see as uh, how change comes about in the in the banking sector. And particularly if the committee was to endorse uh, the proposal for a forum uh, and that we, we engage in the forum to start to work through these issues so that, that when change comes about, that it's a change that we can accept and that the type of uh, people like Gary's um, um, uh, we, we talked about gets a service and gets access to a service when they need it. They may not need it every day, but that it's there for them when they need it. So uh, we think the forum is the best vehicle for that, for us to have an open debate uh, and for us to, to try and agree principles around how change comes about, around digitization, around AI, uh, that would lead to, you know, still a thriving banking sector, because that's what we all want, but a banking sector that's much, much more inclusive and transparent than it is today. Gary, is that you? Yeah, no, I just wanted to well, thank uh, John for those um, very important suggestions. I think as a committee, we need to follow those up, and I know the chair has already um, mentioned that. Uh, it is something, look, we all recognise that as a society, we're changing in how we do things. But what we can't do is ride roughshod over uh, the staff involved in those branches, but also the very uh, people that those branches are were, were set up to serve. Uh, th those people are as valuable to our community as someone who, as I say, can do things entirely remotely. So. Uh, thanks for the presentation and, and hopefully we can uh, continue that conversation with you uh, as we go forward into the future. So thanks for, for your presentation. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Guy. And John, just to indicate, we have been in correspondence with the Financial Conduct Authority and there's a response in our committee packs this week um, back from them in relation to uh, branch closures and their expectations. Um, and we are going to uh, we're going to reach out to see if we can have a, a, an informal engagement with them, and also we will share the communication that we've had back um, with yourselves, so that that might be helpful. Um, and we do also have an informal meeting with the banks organised for next week, along with UK Finance Committee. Um, so that that will, I suppose, give us the opportunity to put all of the points that have been raised um, um, through today's meeting to them. And just a final question for me, I forgot when I was asking mine at the start, in relation to the Ulster Bank employees in the north, um, and yes. you had indicated that, you know, certainly from um, your own evaluation, that those roles could potentially be redeployed. Have you had any engagement with Ulster Bank or NatWest in respect of that? We, we've ongoing engagement with them in, in relation to that, and we'll continue that. But I do think that part of that, you know, needs to be a public debate because what has happened to these staff is that they, they are focused exclusively on the Republic of Ireland. But prior to that, they conducted work on behalf of Ulster Bank in Northern Ireland, and that work was transferred to the UK. And, and so we think there's a very, very cohesion to transfer that work back in a gradual process as the work in the Republic of Ireland uh, dissipates and, and save those jobs. So we believe those 600 jobs are very, very valid jobs that have a future. But, and it just requires that one strategic decision from NatWest in, in, in relation to, uh, in relation to um, transferring work back into, in, into Belfast. Highly educated, highly skilled young workforce uh, and we believe that, that uh, a decision at the top in, in that West uh, needs to be made. It hasn't been made yet, but needs to be made that can save those jobs. Thanks for that. Um, that's something that we can also take up with, with, with that West. 
Um, and look, thank you very much for your presentation this morning. Um, and I, we can put it to the committee um, afterwards whether we, they will agree to endorse the call for a, a banking um, forum. So we, we can seek to do that and to reflect that to the minister and the department as well. Um, but look, thanks very much for your briefing this morning. It has been very helpful for us as a committee in terms of our ongoing scrutiny of, um, of the, the role of banks as part of our economy brief. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you to your colleagues, uh, Vajir, and, and your colleagues on the committee. Uh, and we very much welcome the engagement and look forward to ongoing engagement. And we will keep uh, the committee informed in terms of development. So thank you again for, for this morning. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, do we want to do our? Let's get agreement first. Yeah. So, members, um, just as I was indicating to to John there, if we could seek um, members' agreement to endorse that call for a, a forum on on banking uh, in the north, is, is that something that members would be be happy to do and to reflect that back to the minister and department? Yeah. Great. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's important. Yeah. Um, and just to remind members that we do have that informal meeting scheduled with UK Finance and the representatives of the banks next uh, Thursday morning at 11. Oh, actually, it's half 10, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. It's slightly earlier. Yeah. OK, so moving on then to our next briefing, which is from the utility regulator update on current issues. Um, and just again to remind members that we are a little bit pushed for time so we can be concise as possible in terms of questions. There is a clerk's memo at page 47 of our packs, a presentation at page 51, um, and then there is the utility regulators forward work program at page 64, the Sony TSO governance consultation at page 88, and a letter from the minister on the energy strategy consultation policy options at page 208. So if I could ask to bring into the spotlight, please, um, John French, who is chief executive of the utility regulator, Kevin Shields, who's director of retail and customer protection at the utility regulator, and Roisin McLaughlin, who is head of network operations at the utility regulator. And if I hand over to yourselves, um, John, uh, to make an opening statement, and then we can bring members in for um, follow-up questions. Uh, well, good morning, Chair, and good morning, Committee, and thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you today to highlight the work of the utility regulator. Um, you've introduced myself and Kevin and Roisin, and we've put a presentation together, as you, I think, is in your packs, and uh, we were just going to walk through that as a starter for 10 um, to try and uh, set out who and what we are. But if there's any questions, Chair, or you want to leave it to the end. Maybe a bit of feedback. There, maybe just ask people to mute when they're not speaking. Sorry, John, you broke up a wee bit there just at the end. But it, it, I, yeah, if you, I think I got most of it. So if you want to go through the presentation, and we'll leave questions till the end. Yeah, or however you want to play it. Yeah. So in terms of um, what, who and what we are, um, members probably know this, but we're an independent non-ministerial government department and we're responsible for regulating Northern Ireland's electricity, gas and water and sewage, sewage industries. We are directed and, and governed by a board and, and chair that's appointed by the Department of Finance and we're directly accountable to yourselves in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Our principal duties uh, are set out in legislation, and most of them come on the energy side, the economy side, uh, from the Energy Order 2003. So in electricity, our main duty is to promote, protect the interests of electricity customers, and in gas, it is to promote the development and maintenance of an efficient econ economic and coordinated gas industry in Northern Ireland. But we have to read that in terms of the legislation um, in the, as through the gas directive, uh, the EU gas directive that ensures that consumer protection and consumer benefit is forefront as we undertake that duty. And then we have similar duties in water, which I, I know is, 
in with the infrastructure committee but uh, that's set out by the water and sewerage services order of 2006 kind of <laughs> that's a statutory duty but what do we do on a daily basis um, so we work to protect electricity and water and gas consumers across Northern Ireland. We provide licenses as per the legislation for those companies undertaking regulated activities in electricity, gas and water. We undertake price controls. So we look at how much different elements of the companies cost and we determine how much they can spend on different items. So. That's from, it's generally the monopoly companies within Northern Ireland and uh, Roisin would look at the side of the network companies. So from uh, Northern Ireland Electricity Networks, um, Northern Ireland Water, Sony, the gas transmission side of thing, the gas distribution. And on Kevin's side of things, the retail work, we would look at the supply companies who have got market dominance. So that would be Power and I in the electricity sector and Firmus Energy in the 10 towns, and SSC Electricity with gas in Greater Belfast and, and to the west. We also undertake tariff with those uh, dominant companies uh, to make sure that they are correctly reflecting the underlying wholesale markets and the consumers are getting the best possible price. In addition, we have codes of conduct. Uh, we look at codes of conduct and codes of practice in terms of how the industry should operate. So this could be around debt, payment bills, provision of services for vulnerable consumers, complaints handling. There's codes on energy efficiency, marketing, the theft of energy, and the format of consumers' bills. So that's all done through ourselves. We monitor and regulate uh, the wholesale and retail markets. And on our website, you can see our transparency reports in terms of how companies are operating and how the different market sectors um, are playing out. We have a joint partnership, as you probably know, with our counterpart in the South, uh, the Commission for Regulation of Utilities, CRU. And through that, we manage the all island single electricity market. And we also undertake, uh, facilitate industry and consumer groups to try and make sure we're getting the best for the energy and water markets here in Northern Ireland. So that could be on vulnerability or bringing the different players together to see if the market is working as efficiently as possible. Moving on to the next slide. Um, this is, uh, this is a couple of graphics from last year's annual report in showing how, what we have helped to facilitate. So you'll have seen, you can see there the investments through the price controls that we brought about in the gas industry, the electricity industry and the water industry since 2009. And that continues onwards uh, with the various price controls and we're just in the process of preparing to release our final determination on Northern Ireland Waters PC21 price control. We also work around promoting sustainable development. And um, as you can see there, it said that 46.8% of electricity was consumed by renewable sources that we've helped deliver through those price controls and various other mechanisms. That's now uh, now increased as NISRA has reported uh, back in September 2020 to 47.7% of uh, electricity consumed from renewables, which is up from 19.5% back in 2014. We provide funding through an ICEP scheme that looks at trying to promote sustainability in terms of making sure people's uh, energy efficiency within their home and their heating systems are as low carbon as possible. And um, we've also worked with parties to increase the amount of renewable generation that has increased, can be accommodated on the grid. So last year was 65%. This month, following trials across the network, that has increased up to 70%. And I think it's just worth reflecting slightly on that because we have a very different energy market to other parts of uh, Europe in terms of the amount of renewables that are there. Um, I was speaking earlier this year to Odd Hacken, who used to be uh, lead the Norwegian transmission service operator. 
and he was just commenting about the complexity of the energy market, the renewable market here in Northern Ireland compared to that in Norway, where it's all hydro. So he was commenting in terms of you can just switch the hydro on and off, where you have a much more difficult market to manage in terms of the amount of renewable wind farms and the amount of uh, solar farms we have here in Northern Ireland. So moving on to the next slide, um, and just to take us through, we've got a couple of slides here, the next four or five slides, and it's not to dwell on them um, in detail, but it's just to kind of give members, committee members, an indication of the price movements that have occurred in the regulatory, regulated energy sector that I mentioned, that we look at the tariffs and kind of show where energy prices have moved over that period. And, um, and it's also to hopefully dispel some of the rumours around that energy prices in Northern Ireland are amongst the highest um, between GB and the Republic of Ireland. So that, that's just the slides. The next couple of slides are just showing how electricity prices, regulated electricity prices have moved since 2006 uh, and how they have been adjusted to with RPI um, to show what the, what that would mean in today's prices. And as you can see, back in October 2008 was the highest prices we've had, um, incurred here in Northern Ireland, where the annual electricity bill for an average house was £762 compared to today's prices of £571. In terms of the next slides, uh, SSE electricity's prices in Belfast and gas to the west areas uh, a similar slide, but it, as you can see, adjusted for RPI, the highest prices were back there in 2011. And then finally, in, in the, on these tables is um, the Firmus Energy supply tariffs um, that saw a 17.75% increase earlier this year. But again, when you look back and compare that against, no, no price increase is... Um, will be enjoyed by consumers or you know we've got we work really hard to make sure that the energy companies in terms of their wholesale buying is as keen as it possibly can be but as you can see back there adjusted to rpi the highest gap prices would have been back uh, in 2018. the next couple of slides just kind of give some indication of where northern ireland is compared to the republic of ireland and uh the Northern Ireland and uh, the UK as a whole, and the, the blue line there is Northern Ireland. So as you can see, as as this decade has moved out, um, and we compare these with Eurostat prices in terms of um, for comparison, Northern Ireland currently, in terms of electricity, is uh, the cheapest of those three areas. The picture slightly changes on the next couple of slides um, in terms of industrial, commercial, um, depending on the size. So there's the second slide is around medium customers, medium industrial and commercial customers, where Northern Ireland is uh, currently in the middle of the pack, but has fluctuated with ROI over the last couple of years. But that's, that is because in... Um, the UK, the UK, the GB would um, would favour domestic prices and try and make skew their their tariffs for um, to make sure domestic tariffs are as cheap as they can possibly make them. Republic of Ireland slightly skew their tariffs on the network side to make sure they're as cheap as possible for um, industrial and commercial consumers. Here in Northern Ireland, we take an unbiased approach, and it, it is kind of what it is. Um, and there again, with large industrial consumers, very large industrial consumers, we're just slightly behind the Republic of Ireland. The next slide in terms of the slide deck is just to kind of reassure people about price movements since the 1st of January, when, uh, when Brexit fully occurred. The blue line in that graph is the single electricity market prices compared to the two, um, two markets that operate in GB, which are in orange and gray. 
And as you can see at the bottom of that, uh, of that period, uh, the price across the single electricity market has uh, remained cheaper than uh, the prices that are being experienced on a wholesale electricity market in Great Britain. So the, the, those slide decks were just to try and give people some indication, committee members some indication of where prices are in terms of Northern Ireland and how we compare to our, our nearest neighbours. I guess the next slide is following on, as you well know, that the DfE energy strategy consultation was released at the end of March there and set out um, a net zero emission target by 2050 um, for energy um, and 70% renewable energy target by 2030. And they looked within that to make sure that throughout that change that energy remains affordable to consumers, which is is vital and I guess we we all we're all probably aware that the UK government yesterday came out saying that we were looking to increase that target by cutting emissions to 78% by 2030 and we're aware of the private members bill looking to um, achieve net zero emissions by 2045 but I think within all that we, we want to really get across to the committee that we need to, there needs to be a focus within that strategy of the cost of this moving forward to both domestic consumers and business consumers and the importance, the underlying importance within that of ensuring economic growth. You probably have seen, and I know there was assembly questions on it around, uh, there was Amber Alerts coming into the Christmas period and there's been one or two afterwards around the security supply in Northern Ireland. And it's very important that we remember that as we increase the amount of renewables in Northern Ireland, that we look to ensure security of supply is still um, high on our agenda because unfortunately over the Christmas period, wind levels were very low and um, extremely low. And, uh, and obviously the sun didn't shine as much, and which caused st strains on the electricity uh, infrastructure. So it's important that whilst we're looking at renewables, we also have an eye to ensuring that the, the lights stay on and we keep security supply. And finally, we just wanted to highlight, it's important within this that whatever's put forward, that it's deliverable and it makes meaningful um, carbon reduction targets. Uh, as we move to 2030 and the 2050 target. That was really all I wanted to say, and thank you for that opportunity, but it was just to kind of give you a background to who and what we are, where prices are in Northern Ireland, and possibly where the new energy strategy that DFE has launched um, sets the targets for going forward in the future. But very happy to try and help and answer members' questions or uh, any points they want to clarify. Um, John, thank you very much for the presentation and um, giving us that overview. I, I want to pick up kind of where you have left off in terms of the energy strategy, um, impact on consumers and prices and um, make, meeting the targets. And um, as it stands, you know, your statutory objectives include customer protection or consumer protection, um, both in the present and in the future. And I, I guess I would have a question around whether you see the need for there to be an, an, an additional obligation in terms of decarbonisation so that priorities can align in that respect. Um, obviously, we want to see um, the, I suppose to put it in, in, just to use the terminology, the just transition to, to, um, to net zero, whereby you know those who can afford at least don't end up paying the price. And that, that, that has to be a central objective to the new energy strategy. But when you look at the fluctuations in like electricity and gas prices, which are linked obviously to the continuing dependence on, on fossil fuels and, and those commodities um, fluctuating in terms of global markets, it, it's, I suppose it's a, an impetus to, to, to progress in terms of investment in renewables and to give that control, I suppose, to communities more locally. So I was just wondering if you could comment around, around those things. Yeah, no, thanks, Chair. I think that's absolutely right. In terms of our statutory powers were set out in 2003, as I, as I mentioned, and the world was very different then, you know, and I think 
we do need to look at how we can successfully support what the guts eating those emission targets and you know, I think we do need to look at decarbonisation in our powers and we do need to look at energy efficiency and sustainability and issues around affordability and fuel poverty. Um, looking, we've been doing a bit of work recently looking at our powers compared to our counterparts in GB and uh, the Republic of Ireland. Our powers are very similar and I think everyone's going through that, uh, that, that uh, thought process at the moment of how they can how regulation can better support um, the future energy market. So, yeah, I, I think there is a discussion there to be had and um, uh, we need to be able to be flexible and agile to meet that those new targets that have been set out. Okay, um, thank you for that. And could I just ask you, John, about uh, LPG and yeah. uh, the, the fact that it isn't uh, one of the um, utilities, if you would call it that, that is regulated by yourselves. Um, and if you see there is scope for something to be done in, in that field, because we've had some communications and we have been in touch with Consumer Council and others are around it as well. So we just wanted to get, and the Competition and Markets Authority as yes. well. I mean, we just wanted to get, I suppose, some insight from yourselves of where you see that. Yeah, well, as you say, we have no powers in that at the moment. Um, it is it is both LPG and home off-grid home heating oil, you know, is around 70% of domestic households here use that as their main heating source. Um, there was a uh, competition commission report back in, in the start of this decade that talked about, they found it strange that there wasn't some form of regulation um, in terms of standards, at least, um, I guess this is a policy decision. This, you know, we will, if that was given to us as a power, we would do it to the best of our ability. But it is, um, it is a policy decision in terms of uh, of both this en possibly this energy strategy and where government want to go on off-grid heating. It isn't one of our powers at the moment. Um, but all we would ask is if it was to be one of our powers that we were given the full range of tools that I set out in, our, in my response to your letter around LPG that we, we could have information raising powers and that we had the power to both look at prices and the standards within the industry. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I'm going to bring in members for a question. Can we bring in John Stewart please? Thanks, Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep, we can. Yes. Um, yes. Yep, thanks, John, for your presentation um, and to your team for coming along today. And just to congratulate you on your new role as well. Uh, unfortunately, this is probably the first time I think we've had a chance to hear from you. And uh, I have met a number of times with your predecessor, um, Jenny, and had a good working relationship with her. So we look forward to working with you and your team going forward. Um, conscious of time today, so just to delve into it, uh, I'm just keen to hear about your recent report on Sony governance. Um, is it your experience, John, or in your experience, how much do you think um, Sony diverged from the requirements of independence? Um, there is a lot of concern about that. Um, another one um, in terms as well of um, just in, um, I've worked with Jenny around infilling um, and trying to see an extension of the gas network. And thankfully, we were very successful in getting natural gas rolled into Whitehead in East Antrim and then the infilling project that's now begun. I'm just keen to get your thoughts as well on how that network can be extended to give more people access to natural gas. Thank you. Thanks, John. Yeah. Um, well, in terms of the Sony consultation that was released back on um, the 2nd of April, this comes. This has been an ongoing process, as you, you members of committee members are probably intimately aware. Um, there was a call for evidence, and um, and this is the next stage of the process to look at uh, proposals going forward. Underlying this is the is our our keenness to ensure that Sony follows the the principles of the UK corporate governance code and. Um, we believe that is an important area of, it provides trans, transparency, it provides good governance as a, as a, as a uh, code, and it also provides 
a challenge function within uh, within the organisation uh, to ensure that the best has been found for Northern Ireland consumers. And I think it's it's just it's just making sure that going forward, Sony look at things um, through a Northern Ireland consumer lens first first and foremost. But I think I might just hand over, if that's okay, to Roisin, um, who who was leading on this. And if Roisin, I don't know if you just want to explain anything from your perspective and whether it's worth uh, going through the various options and explaining why we've come to those four conclusions. Of course, thank you. Um, I mean, the, the the question was couched in terms of how so many diverges or might diverge from the independence requirements. I suppose it's important to say that the independence requirements in the Sony license aim to ensure operational independence of the TSO business from security and supply. So the, those requirements don't extend to um, independence from Sony's parent company, Airgrid PLC. Um, but that being said, I mean, our uh, review of Sony's governance has identified a number of concerns about the relationship between the parent and the subsidiary. And I suppose there are overarching concerns identified by stakeholders around transparency and accountability. And then there are more specific concerns, such as the extent to which management decision making is taking place on a shared management basis within the airgrid grip, potentially to the detriment of Northern Ireland consumers, and also whether the protections which should govern collaboration between Sony TSO and, and airgrid TSO in that shared model are either missing or are not working as intended. Um, so those, I suppose, those types of concerns and issues, you know, you might say that those are symptoms of a situation where the balance within the relationship between the parent and the subsidiary has tipped too far in favour of the in favour of the parent, and the license protections need to be augmented. Um, our review identified a number of, of potential risks for Northern Ireland consumers, and the options in the paper then are designed to to address those risks and. There are four options in in the paper, um, and they're quite they're quite detailed options, um, but they have a, a number of elements, um, both changes to board level, both structures, uh, the management independence, which would support the Sony board, and then other governance um, arrangements, um, and. Option A is, is is the less stringent of the options, and they get progressively more independent as, as you progress from option A to to option D. Um, I'm more than happy to take uh, questions on, on on the detail of any of those options. Thank you for that. Um, and actually, it might be useful for you to to give us a wee bit more detail in terms of the. The options, I think we all agree there needs to be um, appropriate transparency and oversight in terms of, of um, the, the operators and, and that you as regulators need to be able to have that. So it might be useful if you would talk us through them and um, your preferences, if you would be able to reflect on that as well. Of course. Okay. So in, in, option, in option A, where um, that option would have... Um, a board which would allow some of the non-executive directors who currently sit on the Airgrid board to sit on the Sony board. Uh, that board, however, would be su supported by a strengthened um, Sony management team in, in key areas such as finance, regulation, um, planning and operations. And there would be a range of other governance mechanisms which are designed to ensure that there is clarity over the interactions between the, the TSOs as they deliver their all island arrangements, and to ensure that the Sony board would would implement a, a cost a conflict of interest policy, for example. Moving then to to option B, um, the key difference between A and B is that is, is at the board level, 
because that option envisages an independent an independent board, albeit we wouldn't rule out the possibility of uh, um, Bearwood PLC having one representative on that board. Moving then to option C, it's a very qualitatively different option. It envisages uh, a standalone Sony with an, a fully independent board um, and a fully independent management and, and staff team. All the same, um, got other governance arrangements to, to improve transparency as all of the other options. But in option C, um, there would be the flexibility for the UR to, um, to approve on a case-by-case -case basis based on um, analysis and information support from Sony um, to allow uh, us to approve an exemption from the standalone requirements to facilitate Sony um, availing from, of air grid staff and, and resources. And then option D then would not allow that exemption. It would be a fully standalone um, Sony with, with no real flexibility, no flexibility in terms of its, its ability to pull in staff and, and resources from Airgrid PLC. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and I suppose, could I just ask, yes, okay. what has your engagement been with Sony in respect of this since the publication of the consultation? And have there, has there been any, I suppose, indication from them around what their um, response might be? Um, we have had, um, the consultation is, 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 is out there. I mean, we had um, briefed Sony on the the proposals and I should say that our provisional preferred options are options B and C um, but there's quite a lot of detail in, in, in the consultation so Sony will need a little bit of time I think to digest what's in there um, but we have um, offered as, as we always as we always would in these circumstances the, the opportunity for detailed engagement on the detail of the consultation as the consultation period goes forward. I have no doubt that we will have that detailed engagement with them. Um, the consultation doesn't close until, uh, until June. Okay, thank you for that. I'm going to bring in other members. Can I bring Stuart into the spotlight, please? Hey, Chair. Yes, uh, and thank you uh, for your uh, the information that you've given us this morning, um, John. In the uh, in the recent Exeter University report into energy governance in Northern Ireland, um, it said that your regu your regulatory remit was somewhat outdated and, and needed reviewing. Uh, and you've already made reference into really what's my second question, which is about the extension of your remit into things like LPG um, and home heating oil. Um, that those may be areas that you would welcome change in your regulatory uh, powers too. But even going beyond LPG and uh, home heating oil, um, we are moving into a very different period where further energy sources will be used uh, to deliver uh, heating uh, across uh, homes in Northern Ireland, indeed businesses as well. Um, most of it uh, will be around the, the area of electricity for heat pumps and also for uh, electric boilers providing hot water systems. Um, and we might even see a return of a more efficient district heating systems as well. Uh, so would, do you re do you recognise what the Exeter University report is saying uh, and do you acknowledge that and indeed would you welcome an opportunity to have your powers and sphere of influence uh, expanded? No, thanks Stuart. Um, in terms of the Exeter University's report, I've, I've read through that. Um, we've all, as I was mentioning earlier, I have look, we have looked at what Ofgem's powers are and we have looked at CIU in equivalent powers. And they're not a million miles away from our own powers at that at this point in time. That said, both all our powers, both ours, off gems and CIU, were written of a similar time, you know. And as I mentioned, that was back in two, for us. It was back in two thousand and three. Um, 
I think theirs was around a similar time, maybe a year or two earlier. Um, but it, it's, 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 you're right, it's how we then move to the new world. And I think we need that agility and we need that flexibility. The point you raise about district heating is an interesting point because the Competition Markets Authority did a, a market study around district heating and they are currently looking at whether Ofgem can take on those powers. Um, but at the end of the day, we're a creature of statute, and if it is decided that we are to take those powers on, um, we will do so. And um, but as, as we as I mentioned earlier, some flexibility I think is needed to try and enable us to help uh, industry and the government and society meet those twenty fifty targets. Um. Stuart, is that you finished? Very brief comment. Um, just to follow on from that, but you do have uh, the duty to encourage energy efficiency um, as a regulator. So how do you see that fitting in with the carbon neutral future? Well, energy efficiency is hugely important, but it, it, it is just, as I've taken the role on Realizing how legalistic some of the issues are, I probably didn't realize that prior to joining. And it, it, it's then, it is sometimes a legal argument around what is our principal duty, and then some of these are secondary duties. So it just, it, it's giving us the flexibility legally that we can maintain the decision, as it's in no one's interest that uh, uh, we would lose on some of these decisions that we make. Uh, uh, in the court level. So the more power we have around those statutory duties, around supporting the movement to 2050 will be really helpful. But absolutely, Stuart, completely agree. Energy efficiency has to be right up there. And John, could I just ask you to go back to John Stewart's question around the infilling of the gas network? Um, I don't think that we got a response in respect of that one. So he's just asked if you could, look, could respond to that. Yeah, sure, sure. Sorry, John. Um, in terms of gas infilling, um, yes, that is, as I mentioned, that is one of our principal duties to support the gas network currently. And we will look at any um, economically viable um, submission by any of the gas distribution companies to, to look at infill. Uh, I know there's recently been the extensions to the West and, and uh, Phoenix have recently uh, been extending down to Newcastle and down and and Firmus have been building up their areas. And as you mentioned, there was that extension to Whitehead. So yes, if there is an economically viable um, proposal put forward by the distribution companies, we will look on it very favorably. Okay, thank you for that. Can we bring John O'Dowd into the spotlight, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, there's clearly those who have political objections to Sony's relationship with Ergood, and there has been, uh, at times, quite a vocal political campaign against that. How do you, as an independent regulator, guard yourselves against political interference uh, at any level in terms of your proposals or decision making processes? Well, I think that's by keeping purely to our statutory remit, you know, being very focused on what we were here and what we were set up to do. As far as I've seen from my five and a bit months at the utility regulator, there's been no political um, interference around any decision making in regards to Sony governments. And Roisin, if she wants to add to this, quite welcome to. It is purely around good governance and purely around transparency around the decisions that Sony make. So it, it is there is, I can say there's not one iota of political uh, interference on this uh, this issue. I know there's a lot of noise out there in the public domain, but from our perspective, and we've sought legal advice on this to make sure we are as black and white on this, uh, that there is no political interference. But I don't know if, Roisin, you want to add to that? To You've been here slightly longer on this process than myself. Well, I'll need to say I, 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 would, I would agree with you, John. I mean, the, the only other observation I would make is that um, the balance that we are trying to, to strike between the interests of the 
the parent company and of consumers is not um, is not a new problem. You know, other re regulators have wrestled with that problem um, and have done so over time, making changes over time. Um, and we can see how challenging the balance has has been to ma maintain. Um, and, and some utilities, and it will be even more challenging, you know, as, as we move from what was a stable environment, both in terms of infrastructure and, and technology and, and for electricity, into a less stable environment as, as we move forward with the electric, with the energy transition. So it's it's not a unique issue that we are wrestling with, in in, in regulatory terms, I suppose is is, is the message. Um, John, do you have a follow-up? Sure. In terms, Roshan, you're saying there you're moving into a less stable environment in terms of the, the electricity market. I mean, up on that term. So could you just expand on what you mean by that? It, it, all I was sort of reflecting was the fact that you know we have we have had traditionally a very stable um, infrastructure picture with. Um, large thermal generators um, providing base load um, power flowing from those generators to, to consumers um, and you know not much innovation underlying that in terms of technology but as we move into the low carbon economy we're, we're seeing I suppose um, the need to accommodate more renewable and distributed generation and, and also new types of, of load um, as things like transport and heating become electrified. So things are changing with, with, the, energy, with the energy transition and it's important therefore in that context that we, we ensure that the interests of consumers are optimised as things change. Okay, I'm conscious of the time limit, so we'll maybe return to this at another time. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, Christopher, can we bring Christopher into the spotlight, please? Thank you very much, and thank you um, for uh, your answers thus far. Um, again, I'm, I'm wanting to return to uh, a theme around Stony, and uh, just as there may be a political bias in those who object to the relationship with Herbert, there's certainly a political bias and those who would defend the present governance arrangements for the sake of that relationship. Um, the, the report that was published says in it, and if I could just read it, items acquired for the all-island system may be over-specified for Northern Ireland or may require adaptation to be used in Northern Ireland. In each case, the additional costs imposed upon Northern Ireland consumers may exceed the benefits of common procurement. That is the case. Does that not call into question the entire relationship and whatever benefit it brings to consumers in Northern Ireland? Well, that goes back to the point we were raising about we have to be proportionate as a utility regulator in what we're proposing. Um, in terms of that, that, that's what I was mentioning earlier, that around making sure that Sony... We're keen to see that Sony look at the world through primarily, first and foremost, uh, a Northern Ireland consumer lens, and then secondly, to see where economies can be, can be economies of scale can be uh, can occur. But I'll probably hand you over to Roshin, if that's okay, in terms of that that area and that, of the report. I mean, I think our, our report identified um, risks for Northern Ireland consumers in a number of areas, but no actual evidence of harm. So, do you know, those risks arise because of lack of transparency, lack of scrutiny on, on Sony's behalf. And all of our, the options are designed to, to address those risks by strengthening the Sony board, the Sony management team, and also, you know, the interactions between the the TSOs um, as they they deliver their TSO function. Christopher, do you want to come back in? Yes, yes. Um, I muted that. Sorry. Yeah, the fact that it's that's even been identified 
as a risk for uh, Northern Ireland consumers um, should concern us. But given the, the weaknesses that the report identified in terms of the, the board of Sony effectively being a toothless tiger, what confidence is there that they're going to come back and support the sort of governance arrangements, either you know, B, C or D options that would actually strengthen their board, given that we have seen evidence that Sony has effectively been emasculated by AirGrid? Well, this is a, no, I understand your point. This is a consultation process. So we put out four, cons, four options. Um, it is a legal, it is a statutory process that we're involved in here. You know, we will then, the second stage of this is for us to come to a decision on which option we're going to take forward. The next stage of that process will be therefore a grid Sony to decide whether they accept the decision that the utility regulator make, or they can then challenge it through the Competition and Markets Authority. So that's the process we're in. Um, we haven't made, we put it forward, the, as Roshin says, the four options with our preference for option B and option C and set that out. But it is a public consultation process at the moment, and we are really keen to hear back from stakeholders, anybody, in terms of do they think we've got it right? Do you think we're missing anything? And um, to try and make sure that it is a balanced, we, when we come to our final determination, it's as balanced as possibly it can be. Okay, thank you. Just let me go back to Christopher. Christopher, do you want to add anything, or can we move on? That's, that's fine. Go ahead. That's no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Can we bring in Sinead, please? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, um, John, for your presentation this morning and, and your uh, answering the, the various questions. It was something that uh, Roshin mentioned um, there she, uh, a few minutes ago. She said that we're in a very rapidly changing operating environment uh, for energy, uh, and um, that's probably as an understatement. And at the moment, you are aware that we've got a new energy consultation um, in and around that strategy out there. What uh, powers or what... Um, what influence have you got in maybe uh, changing some of the direction or um, ensuring that we're not going down the wrong direction? For example, um, I'm reading, I read an article in Bloomberg there um, yesterday, and it was talking about the end of, of gas. Gas is dead. Uh, we're moving on. Um, and yet here in Northern Ireland, it's pretty extensive and intensive investment in the gas infrastructure is still taking place and they were talking about you know coal um it took a long time for for um you know consumers to move on from from fossil fuels coal but it's going to be much much quicker uh for the transition um out of gas and are we investing heavily in a place that we should not be and we should be looking at overcoming um, uh, uh, and jumping over that gas investment and moving into the next, because the, the next level of renewables have arrived. They're here, and we need to kind of move forward with it. And what's your role as the utility regulator to make sure that you know we're not investing in a fuel that we're going to say is dead uh, in a very short space of time? Because we have to think of the consumer here uh, as central to all of the decision-making processes. No, well, thanks for that, Sinead. Um, our statutory powers, as they currently stand, still look at, uh, as, you, as I've mentioned, promoting the, uh, the economic development of the natural gas industry in Northern Ireland. And I think it's just important to say that there is still a significant amount of in investment that has occurred in the natural gas industry in Northern Ireland. And that still has to be paid off. So uh, it's not that if we turned off the gas tomorrow that there would be no net consequence for consumers here in Northern Ireland. There is still about, um, from the figures I've got here, there's still about £655 million to be paid off on a distribution network and about 604 uh, 
thousand million pounds to be paid off on the, tran the transmission network. So this still has to be paid back in terms of the investment that has already been undertaken here in Northern Ireland. Um, but I just wanted to give Kevin a chance to speak because Kevin's been uh, working strongly with this with the department uh, for a while. So Kevin, do you want to just give your reflections? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, thanks for the question. So it's a really good question. Um, the, the energy world is changing. It's changing very rapidly, as, as Roshan alluded to earlier, and other, and, other, and other committee members have asked about, and uh, we need to reflect that. We're, we're working quite, we've been working quite long and hard with, with DFE as they've developed their, their options consultation that went out. Um, and obviously, it's very much the role of the department to derive and deliver the new strategy. But we have been engaged with them quite, quite closely on many different levels to, to help them uh, where we can help them, help them understand what, what the key factors need to be. Um, the, in terms of the gas specifically, I mean, gas across the world has been looked at as in a decarbonized context. It is, it is ultimately a fossil fuel, of course, and decarbonization needs, we need to move away from fossil fuels. The question in it, I suppose, in our jurisdiction is, to what extent it is a bridge fuel between where we are now as an economy and society and where we want to get to in 2050, which is the, the time horizon that the department are looking to in their new strategy consultation. So it is a John's right, we, we, we still have a lot of investment to pay off in Northern Ireland. It is the least polluting of fossil fuels. So it is, it is a bridge fuel that we can use to transition from where we are in 2021 through to where we are, need to be in 2040, 2050. And then there's the issue of, of what they call green grass, hydrogen, biomethane, and the extent to which um, our gas network and gas system can be trans, transformed into a, to a hydrogen-based system. Now, those questions uh, need, need looked at and answered um, across many jurisdictions, not just Northern Ireland. And the, the technology is not there yet. There are lots of pilots going on around that. So I suppose from the department's point of view, it's a, it's a bit of a balancing act around which uh, fuels work best and which time horizons in order to balance decarbonisation and with costs, with security supply. And it's not an easy, it's not an easy set of equations to answer. And that's what their, their options consultation is all about in that area. So there's no clean cut answer at this point, and the department haven't costed the, up the various options yet. So we we haven't been able to look at it through that lens. But um, I was I suppose I'd end by saying it's it's early days in the sense of the options consultations out right there, and there's there's a lot of analysis still to be done on what heating heating options are going to work best in the future for Northern Ireland. Sinead, do you want to come back in? I mean, I understand that this is a difficult, um, this is a difficult field, uh, and probably maybe some of the innovation um, is not just where we would want it to be at the moment. But I think that there's a, a little bit of delusional optimism, should I say, um, in and around the conversations about gas, uh, and just to maintain, oh, this is a bridge or this is we're in transition, but heavily investing in that transition um, and how long that that's going to actually maintain. And I think we've got very optimistic and ambitious targets for uh, zero carbon and gas is a fossil fuel and it doesn't fit with it. So I don't, I, you know, I just, the problem is going behind with gas, you know, and we're playing catch up. We've actually missed the boat here because um, it was it was a fuel for you know the past, but it's not a fuel for the future. It, it, it's not a fuel for the long term future. You're absolutely right, Sinead. And the question is, what's our transition path away from from fossil based uh, natural gas going to be? And how, how quickly Northern Ireland optimises that? Remember also that half of the premises in Northern Ireland will never be on the natural gas grid, either now or in the future. And much of the heating debate then is going to be about the off-gas grid options for, for Northern Ireland and what the most efficient uh, way forward is on that area. Um, and that's half, half the premises in Northern Ireland we're talking about there. Okay, thank you.
Janine, is that you? Do you have any additional questions? No? Okay, thank you. Um, John and Roisin and Kevin, thank you very much for your presentation. It's been very useful for us and, and I'm sure we'll be engaging with you again in, in the not too distant future as we continue our work around the energy strategy as well. So thanks very much for joining us this morning. No, thanks for the opportunity to speak to members and yourself. Thank you. Okay, members, is there any actions that we need to take forward? That no, what we'll do, Chair, is we'll um, rearrange another um, briefing once that um, SUNY governance consultation has closed. So probably going to have to be then the autumn because that's going until the end of June. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on then to um, agenda item 11, which is the SR um, that we dealt with at the SL1 last week. Yes. Um, it's SR 2021-103, the Employment Rights Northern Ireland Order 1996, Protection from Suffering Detriment in Health and Safety Cases, Amendment Order NI 2021. There is a clerk's memo at page 68 of table papers, and the SR is at page 70 of the table papers. This statutory rule extends protections against detriment in health and safety cases to workers in relation to any action they may take to protect themselves or others where they reasonably believe there is serious or imminent danger in their workplace. Um, the rule will come into operation on the 31st of May. It is subject to confirmatory resolution procedure. The examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on the rules, so members will be agreeing to it um, in subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. So, if members are content, we'll put the question. Yep. Yep. Right. So, the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2021-103, the Employment Rights, Northern Ireland Order 1996, Protection from Suffering Detriment in Health and Safety Cases, Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2021, and recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly, subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report. Okay, thank you, members. So we're going to go back now and begin to deal with our matters arising and, and try to get through as many as possible before we have to leave this room at 12. So if we go to 6.1, which is at page 369 of your packs, there is a copy um, of a letter from the Committee for Infrastructure to the Economy uh, Minister regarding the number of applications her department has received from taxi operators to Part B of the CRBSS requesting that she engages with the Infrastructure Minister to ensure immediate funding of the taxi, bus and coach sectors. And obviously this is an issue that we've had considerable correspondence ourselves with the Department around. So um, that correspondence is just to note at this stage and I'm sure committee members will, um, will support the, the call from the Infrastructure Committee. Okay, so moving on then to 6.2, page 371, there is an update from the EU Affairs Manager on Common Frameworks. Um, and sorry, could everybody who is not speaking just mute their mics because there's a wee bit of feedback, I think, coming through there. So if you could please do that. Um, more clarity has been provided about the timeline for the conclusion of the Common Frameworks process. It is hoped that the majority of frameworks will be put forward for scrutiny by the summer and the programme completed within 2021. Additionally, the Common Framework Scrutiny Committee published its report, Common Frameworks Building a Cooperative Union, on the 31st of March. So that um, update is just to note at this stage and we'll come back to anything that is relevant to this committee. Is there still people? I'm just, I'm just trying to get that sorted. Yeah. Um, okay, so moving on then to page 371, there are, are documents from Queen's University following on from the informal meeting held on the 18th of March. So the documents include a joint submission agreed by a stakeholder group in relation to the draft programme for government, also an overview of the Belfast Region City Deal innovation projects that Queen's is working on in partnership with industry and local authorities, two short overview documents. Um, relating to the strength and places fund bids that Queen's are involved in and an overview of the potential for UK or um, Ireland research partnerships which would support the all-island work. Um, so the stakeholder group paper represents the collaboration between schools, FE and HE and is their response to the draft PFG. It usefully summarises the issues that they face and has some key asks and that is to ensure successful delivery it may be useful to focus on a smaller number 
of key strategic priorities in the PFG that will deliver greatest impact while optimising the added value from resource allocation. Also calls for a commitment to design and implement a long-term sustainable funding and regionally balanced model for tertiary education um, and that that is an urgent commitment. Demographics will, within a few years, see thousands more young people each year eligible but not able to be accommodated for post-compulsory education here in the north because of funding restrictions. Obviously, that's an issue that's been raised with us a number of times in relation to our skills work. A partnership approach between government, post-primary and tertiary education providers, business and industry can deliver an effective 18 to 25 skills-based initiative to support all learners and create a tertiary education system for the North that del delivers the skills for sustainable economic growth. The enhanced mobility, flexibility, adaptability and informed choice that this partnership for skills would bring is of great potential. Um, it offers a holistic, student-centred approach, enhanced opportunities for widening participation and security in the supply of economically valued skills for our economy. So if members are agreed, we will for forward that stakeholder group's paper to the Education Committee, requesting that it engages with the Education Minister to support the kind of collaborative approach outlined by the paper and that it is needed to rebuild our economy and educational model. And obviously this is work that we have already taken forward ourselves in terms of um, the Department for the Economy. So our members agreed with that? Yep. Uh, agreed, Chair. Thank you. C can I make a comment, Chair? Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, I think it's a useful paper and feeds into that ongoing debate we're already having about the future of further higher education and its purpose and how it fits into uh, re-imaging the economy and the purpose of the economy. Can I also, just while we're talking uh, about the universities, just raise the issue of the Ulster University and the recent media speculation around the costs of the Belfast campus. Uh, and could we get agreement for the committee to write to the department for uh, an update in terms of the campus and uh, the budget associated with that? Yep, our members agreed. Yep, thank yep. you. Thank you. Okay, then moving on to um, 6.4, um, which is a response from Belfast City Airport um, in relation to the EASA professional pilots licence and air traffic controller licences post Brexit. The airport advises that as an airport operator, they are not in a position to comment on the pilot licensing scheme. Um, with regard to air traffic control licensing, they don't expect the change to have any impact locally. Um, obviously, this is an issue that's actually impacting on pilots, though. Is there any further? We, we do. We have correspondence from the CAA uh, further. We might not get to that, but basically what, what they have done is they have transferred um, UK-based pilots licenses to a European Union company, no, sorry, European Union country, uh, and then they will also relicense them very quickly for the UK, so apparently that will solve the problem, but it's further on in the pack. Can we seek a member's agreement to share that response with the that's, person who had that's what contacted seek, us? Yeah, that's what we're seeking to do. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. So members are agreed we will do that, just in case we don't get to uh, that correspondence item. Okay. Thank you. So moving on then to um, 6.5 and 6.6, .6, page 7 of your table papers, there's a response from the Minister dated the 19th of April regarding the committee's request for the COVID student support payment to be extended through an amendment to the Budget Bill. The Minister states that it is not feasible to make the necessary legislative amendments within the required time frame. The Minister also advises that financial support is available to students experiencing financial difficulties while studying through two funds, both the Department's Student Support Funds and the University's Hardship Funds. And then at page 9 of your table papers, there's an earlier response from the Minister dated the 16th of April in response to the committee's support for the motion passed in the Assembly regarding support for students, stating that officials were undertaking further work to ascertain the viability of options to extend um, the COVID disruption payment. So. We are awaiting a more substantive response from the Minister and members will likely have noted in the allocation statement yesterday some additional funds being allocated to student hardship and student support, quite significant, 27.3 million. Yeah, Chair, um, can we, ask for we, we can seek clarification because we, um, we have a budget briefing in next week. So the other thing I'd be to flag up to members is that there, there is a significant amount of money that Treasury did permit to be carried over into this financial year, but because of 
some kind of complication around the Secretary of State not signing it off. It's not in the upfront budget, but it'll be allocated through monitoring rounds and further allocations. So it's just a little bit more untidy, but we can seek more information on that from the officials next week. Okay. But it just it just means that you, they're not able to put it in the, in the upfront budget. It's going to have to be requested going forward, which just means we don't get sight of it as soon. But we can get yeah. it. just to clarify. Sorry, Chair McMillan. Yes, go ahead, Sinead. So just in relation to the minister's response, I think the most telling part of that letter is um, was in the last paragraph when it, she said that um, it was not ne it was not feasible to make the necessary legislative amendments within the stated and required time frame. So it seemed to be very time bound rather than anything else because we know um, throughout COVID legislation has been drawn up uh, and passed extremely quickly um, uh, and concerningly so at times. But um, if it can be done for um, other grants and other supports, then legislation can be drawn up uh, that allows the minister to, to give grant and support to students. But it seemed to be that it was within the time frame. So we do know that there were budget pressures to get money spent uh, before the end of the financial year. If that was the only bar barrier, then it's incumbent upon the minister now to go back and look at it and take the time um, that she needs, uh, put in the place the legislation and pay the students the money. So, um, I mean, it is a very telling phrase within the response that she gave, and I think we need to question her in that. Was this about um, the budget timelines, or was this about the students? Thanks, Sinead. Um, John O'Dowd is looking to come in there as well. John, I think you might be on mute. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm slightly confused about the, uh, the amendments to the budget bill. Uh, that may be a procedural matter in relation to the allocation of the COVID funds to the department necessarily to cover uh, the additional costs. But we also raised with the Minister about changing the regulations which she's using to make these payments or to bring forward uh, a revised regulation as to how she's moving these payments. And I don't see any mention of that uh, in her responses. Both of the responses seem to be contradictory. I'm not clear if the Minister intends to. Uh, enact the will of the Assembly and the will of this committee by extending the payments, or she's not going to. But quite simply, I think it's unacceptable that at this stage the Minister has not made a policy decision. And that's what's required, first and foremost, is a policy decision uh, which would indicate what her pathway is. And hopefully that policy decision would be to extend the payments to that wider group of students the Assembly has backed and um, the committee has backed. So, uh, it is a disappointing response, but until we get a policy decision, then yeah, I think we're going to continue to run in circles on this. Thanks, John. Um, and Peter is indicating that we are still awaiting a response to our correspondence in respect of the regulations. Chair, the, the, the two letters, that it, there is a, it, they are a bit confusing because the way they're, they're dated. The, the first one deals with the response to amending the budget bill, which we'd first initially talked about, um, to try and get the, the wider... Um, the, the, the wider money out to, to more students. That response is now massively kind of out of time, if you like, because that, that, that budget bill has been and gone. But, but it's just strange that it's dated after the other one, which actually responds to our request around uh, a new um, SL1 and a SR allowing wider payment. So my understanding from the, from the other response, from the second response, is that that's what's being looked at now and that we're waiting for a substantive response on how and if and when um, they can widen out the legislation to reach more students. So it might also be useful, again, because we have the officials in next week on budget to get clarification on that. But that's kind of the understanding I've got from it. They are currently scoping what would be needed to get the wider payment out? Uh, Peter, just in respect of that, because when we get budget officials, they sometimes will respond that they can't give us the policy ask or the policy response. So could we just ask the department around those additional allocations that were made yesterday and, and what those are intended for? 
Um, Chair, we go ahead. Chair, as part of the briefing. Yeah, go ahead, John. Just on that point, uh, I'm wondering: is the the money announced in the finance minister's statement confirmation of the money which was previously announced, I think, in January, as part of allocations, the COVID allocations? Um, I just think I, I'm of the view that it's not new money; that it's just confirmation of a previous allocation. If it is new money, fantastic! It's quite a significant allocation and probably would have covered the cost of the five on the prime COVID extension to a significant number of students, but I suspect it's confirmation of a previous allocation. Okay. Chair, yeah, I, I think I think, I think Mr. Dow's right there. The 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 money hasn't gone to the students yet, so this covers that payment. So it's not um it's like I'd said before, that the, the money has been retained but it now has to be allocated on a um um a basis of the business case comes. It's not in an upfront budget because because of the the, the sort of issues I'd outlined before about um, Secretary of State having signed off on the money being rolled over, which is a whole other complication. I'm not 100% on the detail of that. So, Mr. O'Dowd's absolutely right. This is going to cover the payment that has already been promised. So, for the, what I've taken from what the department's saying is that they're now scoping cost and legislative parameters for any extension of that, and we'll then have to draw down money. But we know there's a, a pot of COVID relief money there that can be drawn down on a, a business case basis. So that's, that's really what we're, we're trying to get clarification on from the officials. So we'll go ahead and specifically ask for them to deal with that next week. Okay, thank you. So, moving on then to 6.7, at page 10 of table papers, there's a written update from the department in relation to the RHI scheme, um, and it advises that the public consultation on the future of the scheme closed on the 9th of April, with over 400 responses received. The final decision on the future of the scheme will be taken by the executive, informed by the public consultation. So, the committee will receive an oral briefing on the outcome of the consultation when that's available, so that... Um, correspondence is to note at this stage, um, and we'll, will we? If we try and keep on going, yeah, we'll okay. Only a few more. So six point eight then at page fifteen of table papers. There's an update on the apprenticeship recovery package, apprenticeship week twenty twenty one, and the Northern Ireland Apprenticeship Awards twenty twenty one. The briefing paper provides details on the uptake in relation to each of the apprenticeship initiatives, um, and that despite this package of support ongoing restrictions and the extension of the job retention scheme are continuing to have a major impact on the return of apprentices in certain sectors and, as you would imagine, particularly hospitality and retail. The department highlights the making apprenticeship opportunities available to more people in sectors by amending age-related criteria as a commitment set out in the Economic Recovery Action Plan. All age apprenticeships have an important role to play in the response to the challenges presented by COVID. So that's to note at this stage, and we can take all of this up with the Minister when she's in with us in May. Uh, on the 12th of May, Chair. Okay. Thank you. 12th, yeah. 12th of May. 12th of May. Um, so moving on then to page 24 of table papers, there's a response from the Civil Avi Aviation Authority. Uh, regarding the status of UK and non-UK issued EASA pilot and air traffic control licences pre and post EU exit. The Civil Aviation Authority states that UK issued pilot licences now have privileges to fly only UK registered aircraft and while UK issued ATCO licences retained their validity, there is no longer an established mechanism for UK issued ATCO licences to exchange their licence with an EU member state. This is a result of the EU's decision not to recognise UK issued licences at this time. The Civil Aviation Authority supported thousands of UK commercial pilots to transfer their licences to other EU member states to allow them to continue to operate within both systems if that scenario were to materialise. And the Civil Aviation Authority has recently introduced a process for these individuals to easily obtain a new UK pilot licence, which they can hold alongside their EASA licence. So members are content, as I referred to previously. We will forward this response to the pilot who raised the matter with the committee. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on then to page 26 of table papers, there's a response from the Financial Conduct Authority that um, I was referring to in our conversation with the FSU 
regarding bank closures by Bank of Ireland. The detail of this response will be included in the briefing paper being prepared for next week's meeting in advance of the informal meeting with the banks and UK finance as well. Um, and I suppose it is just useful for members to refer to um, what they have said around the closures. So at least to note this stage. Um, at page 28 of table papers, then, there's further correspondence from an independent wedding venue owner seeking clarification on matters raised in the response from the Minister. A copy of the Minister's previous response regarding uh, wedding venues referred to in the correspondence is at page 43 of table papers. So if members are agreed, we will forward to the Department uh, that, sorry, that correspondence to the Department to seek clarification in relation to the additional issues raised. So members are content. Thank you. We want to stop chair, there. if we defer, then if members are in agreement, Chair, we can um, seek correspondence um, agreed by email um, and any other items that are left on the agenda. I think it's, it's essentially just the correspondence. Do we want to agree your forward work programme? Yeah, sure, that would be that would be helpful in agenda item eight. Yeah. So if members go to agenda item eight. Um, at page 64 of table papers is a copy of the forward work programme. So the Minister will brief the committee on the 12th of April, as we've um, already indicated, and we will get a briefing next week on the budget position. So are members content with the forward work programme? Thank you. And then just moving on to any other business, none has been indicated. No, so sure. um, then the final item is date, time and place of the next meeting, which is next Wednesday morning in room 30. And just to remind members that the informal meeting that had been scheduled for tomorrow with the National Insulation Association has been cancelled and will be rescheduled. So that's the meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assembly, committee room 29.